such a gift to be able to be together um, in person and virtually. We are brought together in the spirit. So let's worship together. <laughs>
Oh, 
Good morning, church. It is good to be together in the house of the Lord. And the house of the Lord is not a village. The house of the Lord is where people gather, even virtually, maybe in some places, especially virtually, to celebrate the goodness of the God that we serve, the God of love. I, uh, some of you may be getting tired of me affirming our worship team, but every Sunday when I preach, I continue to stir about the message and about what it is that God is concerned my heart by what we're singing. We're singing about the things that we're talking about, and the movement beyond that is even that we're singing about the things we're talking about and that we're aspiring to be, to do, to become. And uh, today, as as, uh, I I couldn't sing for a while because I was weak, what it says to the goodness of the Lord, and this uh, uh, song uh, called the goodness of the Lord just really caught me deeply this morning. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days, all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head down, all I will say is my goodness of the Lord. And then that declaration that we sang together, and often we sing words, and I challenge people to say, sing them and allow them to become what is really in your heart, what is really not words about, I think this should be true, but it is true, and just that declaration, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. And every breath, with every breath that I breathe, I will sing of the goodness of the Lord. Brent and I were talking this week, probably numerous times about the reality of this uh, series on clarity. And uh, just, it's been a while since I preached two Sundays in a row, three Sundays in a row, four Sundays in a row, next Sunday, five Sundays in a row, and, and talk with Katrina again this morning as well. This has been the inspiration for me. Why? Because these are things that God planted in my life more than 12 months ago. I've been sitting with them, percolating, soaking, and then a chance to sit and actually preach and teach and study in these places has, has stirred some of you. That sense of the delight of the Lord to take deeper. To go beyond head knowledge, I know about this, to heart knowledge and experience of this is true for me, for you, for us as followers of Jesus. So this month, uh, we've been we've been looking at this uh, this kind of foundational character series of, on the traits of disciples. Um, of Jesus in this, uh, this message. And are you, are you getting that uh, projection up there with the slide? The, the slide, for some reason, my uh, glasses are up there right now. I'm not sure why. Do you know why? Um, it's probably a setting thing. I just might have got onto, and it's okay. It, it, it's, it's not huge. Most of you remember for other times this image of glasses and a cityscape about vision. When the glasses are off, we see clearly when the glasses are off, like I said last week, I can't tell who any of you are other than I might remember the color of what you are, because I'm blind to that almost without these things. And then it comes to them. And a recognition that in that context, this is about seeing clearly. And really the seeing clearly is foundational to see clearly is that our heart is right, our character is right. We can form the shape in such a way that our human nature and distractions aren't keeping us from being able to see what it is that God is doing, what's happening in the kingdom. And so I've been inviting us to reflect on our own lives, our own walk with Jesus. This isn't more information, it's really those triggers for transformation where God comes and changes us from the inside, where we move into that place where the pressure and the heat is up. We've been talking about that. I'll review that a little bit here in a second. Where the heat is up and we recognize we're living in a context where the heat is really hot, the pressure's hot. 
your workplace, your friend, friend base, wherever it might be, something could pop up where suddenly everything's tense. Because we don't see exactly the same way. And I often find myself reacting and responding rather than listening and loving deeply. Catch myself in the act of just reacting and responding, emotions coming up inside. And in that, I say, I want to you see. I want to hear, I want to know what's happening inside rather than trying to convince somebody of what I see and I perceive. So today's message, this is for me, I'm saying, it's how about you, how is that going? But today's message is really about listening to Jesus. Listening deeply and obeying, and when I'm listening deeply, it is usually about what God wants to do in me. I'm not listening deeply because I want to get a message for you, because quite honestly, this has been about me and what God's been teaching me during this time as well. But it's for us together to say, what is God speaking to us? To change us from the inside, to turn up the heat and expose the impurities of the cross, and allow the Holy Spirit to skip them off. We've talked about that. This is not what we are seeing, this attitude and posture of what is God doing in me, is not what we're seeing in the church in this season. At least not by much of the church that I've observed. I'm not talking about EC, but I'm talking about as a whole. We're pointing fingers at one another and telling other people what they should think or what we believe God is telling that person to do. We need a renewal. We need a revival. God has to speak to you. God has to speak to me. What is he speaking to you lately? About your heart, about your attitudes, about your fears, and that he's been speaking to me about mine. How is he been shaping our hearts in this time? Shaping to them so that we want nothing more than to hear him speak to us and obey his voice. I want to take you back quite a number of years. I'm now 58, so I can go back pretty much a number of years. I can't go back quite as far as I can go back a number of years here. But 82, I'm starting college at once again. No, still, just back from the yes program. Brendan and I are officially dating now. We met all the yes team, yes team, wait, so we wait until afterwards, and then we started relationships. And in that context, a recognition that in that space and place, I was starting to train and to be a quiz around the whole area of pre med. My father was a chiropractor, I was thinking of going to chiropractic to be good pre med. So I'm in those both pre med. And I'm telling the story because it's a little bit around this whole thing about changing. That God is doing something in us in that context. And in this class, one of my classmates I got to know that first semester, biology 101, foundational thing for a pre med student, and we're taking an exam. Lisa was a friend of mine who studied some time in the library together, I didn't know her before I met her in college there, and uh, we're taking an exam. You know, this kind of auditorium type classrooms where they're slanted out with the professor up front, and there's, you know, you're sitting kind of a one row higher each time, also that stadium, and I'm going to class, and so Lisa's in front, we're taking a test. I get to one section, and I'm like, man, it's one of those ones where you kind of have to remember sequence of things, so I'm kind of doing that, but I glanced up and had my eyes open, Lisa was on the same page. Exact same place, except she was done. And I saw that whole section of answers, B, A, T, C, C, B, whatever it was. Now it was already there. What was I going to do? Would have I got it all wrong? No, I'm pretty smart. Would have I got it all right? No, I'm probably not as smart as, smart as Lisa was. And I felt like I was like, no, 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 what do I do? But in that context, space, you kind of sat there a bit and I was like, you know what, I'm not sure what to do. And I just wrote it down and I went, wrote it down like I see it. I didn't know what else to do. Normally I call that cheating. I don't know what you guys call it, but that's what I call cheating. And I never was a cheater in school, I was never one to do that. And I didn't try to cheat. Finished the test, handed it in, gave it to Dr. Dobbins, you know, play it out. When I'm like, kind of going my very way, because it's almost like I forgot about it, it's like, you know what, it just happened. 
I was the leader of the Millersville Christian Fellowship. I was the vice president of my freshman year. Did all of these things, you know. In the sense of what I represented as one who cared deeply about what was happening and, and what God was doing. And just coming back from yes, I was in a place where I wanted to walk the meeting. And this would not go away. God kept bringing me back and bringing me back. I am like, not the main doctor that wants to tell us what happened. But you know that prompting voice for after a while, you can't say no to So by the two days later, I went back to the office of Dr. Dobbins and I started to share. And I just said, I, I need you to know. I explained the situation. He looked at me, looked incredibly disappointed. Uh, I mean, he was a good student. He knows I knew he liked me. In that context, I knew he respected me. But this said, disappointment just sort of happened. Even though I felt like I could try, it still happened. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Pete, I could fail you. Not just for this test, but for the whole class of the uh, The city can feel it. I don't know. And he said, well, you know what? I appreciate you coming. Don't worry about it. Something happened in my heart that day about this place of listening to the still small voice in a man. It began to change the way that I would engage, no matter what it cost me. To obey is better than sacrifice. It's that sense of saying, you know what, I'm going to obey. I can make lots of sacrifices, but you know what, I'm going to obey and trust God in the circumstances. Did you keep moving here? Or I'll uh, run you over like I did, not run over you, but run you over like I did the last time. Uh, a recognition that in this process, uh, this battery theory is really about not forming and shaping our hearts, our attitudes, our character, so that His glory can be expressed in our lives. See, when we're responding with godly character in a way that he's called us to, not because we're saying, I'm going to try harder to be more godly, but because it says, I can't be more godly, and you need to change me, Lord, to transform me from the inside out, that we now become actually that which reflects the glory of God. And when we are being transformed, and we're, and we're kind of stuck with where we're at, we're not going to change anything, we're not going to go, go back and try to adjust the wrong with the, with the, with the message, whatever, uh, with, the, with the testament, the cheating, whatever it might be. We lose our muscle and are willing to be captured in our hands. And that's one of the things I feel when God's called me out this season to the church. In the middle of the pandemic and all the challenges are there, and we lost our muscle so that the glory is radiant, radiant instead of light. And what in the midst of that would God need to do for that muscle? You see up on the screen here the character equation presence plus purity plus passion plus purpose plus posture equals that glory of God, that glory that we desire to see be revealed. For us to see his glory, inviting him to show us his glory, but his glory to reflect all of our lives. Through our lives. We talked about those first three presence, purity, and passion, and today we're going to focus on purpose. But before we do that, I'm just doing a quick review of the first three. Presence, of course, we talked about the experience of God's deep love and growing in my capacity and our capacity to sense, know, and encounter God's presence in our daily lives. I challenged us on that Sunday to, to reflect on how in 2021 you and I might look to God to develop new ways for us to practice the presence of God so that that is a normal part of our daily routine of love. Each day, because the truth is that we are often not aware of God's presence, which is around us all the time. We're more caught up in trying to do the right thing, we're trying to avoid doing that thing, but God's presence is here in the person of the Holy Spirit, is always right with us, no matter how dark the situation might seem, how it might feel, or even how it might be. It might be. God is inviting us to stop regularly throughout the day and acknowledge His presence and stop to listen to what God might be speaking to us. We talked also about purity in week two. Purity in the understanding of and submitting to God's purified work in our lives as His sons and daughters. I'm not going to reflect on this one a whole lot more than to say the, the key piece to that, which actually came with this interaction with Trina as was thinking through this message, was that 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 Refining of the of the of the metal and of the, the, the heating to what the text we use that age we keep right there in the heat and it pushes the brings to the top the impurities that easily can be slipped off. 
It's in the tough times and in the trials and the struggles. James 1 that we talked about that week, that those things come out to the surface. The ugliness of our responses, the ways we react, they come out in pressure. And that pressure is actually a gift from God to bring out the things that we wrap stuff down and hide and try to put a mask on. No pun intended. But a reality of that process. This week, as we were focusing on this, and, and, and uh, as we were talking about this, and uh, of course, that focus on James 1, uh, in Bridge Team, we were just talking a bit about this, and one of the Bridge Team members just shared about the rest of James 1 and that passage. Uh, and I said, uh, I don't think I really gave him, I think I gave you any good word at all about that. Not really, okay. Uh, I just told him there's something there that I think would be valuable. Share with God. And so uh, I'm going to have you come up just briefly here and share with us, John. Thank you. Um, just for a little perspective, in 1982, I was two years old, so. <laughs> um, when Keith asked me to share a little bit about this, I, uh, my initial reaction was, I don't have anything to share. I don't know what's going on in me that um, is, has value to share to somebody else, but I continue to sit with um, James 1, especially um, verses 2 through maybe uh, 6, and so I'm just going to read them really, really quick. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And uh, that pressure that Keith was talking about, I feel frequently, and I, I continue to sit with this passage. And I continue to struggle with it. I love it, and I really don't like it at the same time. It continues to like just push on me in a lot of different ways. And so it's been a it's been a real challenge to kind of think about the ways God is taking that and and pushing things out of me, like pride. And you know, that's one of the things that for me, I don't want to be lacking anything. I want to be complete and mature. And God continues to push that pride out. And um, yeah, it's it's just a real challenge. So thank you. Thank you for uh, being willing to share. Uh, it was a little bit of worship, I hope not too much. Um, but that snapshot is really important because often we want our testimony to be complete. As in, we're done, and we like to talk about it. I used to struggle with this, but then Jesus came and I don't anymore. The only reality is that for most things, at some level, we still keep on struggling. That pride is one of those. I, I, I hope you're aware of this, really, Jonathan, but you're not going to get rid of pride the whole way. You're going to become more aware of the pride pattern of pride, which you already have, because you're open to it, and that transforming work brings the heat. Brings more dross to the surface of the skin and all, and God purifies you and me in that place to start. That's what purity message was really about. The third we talked about, of course, last week was passion, growing in our understanding of what it looks like to surrender our whole being. I talked about the, the thing that I like to do in worship is surrender, completely letting go, but that surrender to a place where I know that I'm giving myself over to a God who loves me. It's a safe place to be. In the place of his discipline, the surrender, the surrender and submission, we need a new, a new understanding of passion. And I propose a new description of passion. That true passion is a willingness to suffer for what you want. What am I willing to suffer for? We use the example, of course, of our children. It's like we make a lot of sacrifices for children because we're like, we love them. I do anything for my children. And my children's children. And a recognition that people who make a difference in their own lives and the world do so by following their passion. And that means making the conscious decision to give up other enjoyable activities 
to focus your energy on the most important activities that God's called you to. So using the example for Donovan, I mean, there's things Jonathan's going to be called to that I'm not called to. Obedience for him, sacrificing some things, are going to be different things than I sacrifice, because the place and space in which God is has put us. And often we don't say, well, whatever he, that great, wonderful bishop, don't get fooled. Um, whatever he's laid down, whatever he's doing, is what I should do. Now, this is what passion is really about. It's about what am I hearing God saying and what am I allowing him to form in me? And the purpose of the kingdom because it's how he's uniquely I don't love running around scooters all over the place and getting more scooters. I do. But <laughs> scooter club will be an amazing form of discipleship. Don't give me ideas. The trace is looking like, geez, stop. Um, so today, having quickly reviewed those, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us with a new revelation around the purpose. Today, Lord, we acknowledge that without your Holy Spirit's presence, I'm just out there bowing away from words. And so we say, come, Holy Spirit. Come in our midst and bring revelation that transforms our hearts, transforms this fellowship, transforms this community because we've been changed by the power of your Spirit and not by our own efforts alone. And so we ask today for fresh revelation, fresh bread, that nourishes and leads us around this area of purpose. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Purpose, as I uh, kind of briefly defined it, what centers around this, this commitment to follow God, uh, committing to follow God, is to purpose to obey, to completely obey what God seeks. And we use the example of violence and test and whatever it is. Seek simple, seek small. But it's the little complete obedience that leads to the bigger complete obedience that leads to the bigger complete obedience because we understand this is what God said and this is what we're being, I being called to do. You see, we all have purpose. We desire a purpose for our lives. We want a reason to live. And the world tells us by happiness or we just need to do things to bring a satisfaction, a sense of accomplishment, and that's part of it. Trying to get to the core of how you're wired. Um, oh, and then the world also says, then just have a lot of fun all the time. Because if you have a lot of fun, you'll be happy. We can take a little snapshot of the world, and I say the world as a whole, in terms of what the end product of that is, we'll say it doesn't end in that place of being at peace. Because we're still trying to say, who am I? Well, that's what God calling you to do. So this question today is how can we learn to follow and obey God? And it's more than just reading the Bible. You know, I, I, I grew up in a context, and please, you know, dear Glenn was a teacher of mine and, and a friend of mine that was a wonderful teacher of the Word. And the Word is important, but this Word, as a friend of mine once said, this Word is nothing more than a dead tree wrapped around with a dead cow and a dead octopus uh, for the for eating. It's all it is. Apart from the power of the Spirit of God, this has no life. And I know that as well because one of my professors at Notre Dame used it as a textbook. And he was an atheist. He didn't like God at all. He actually knew those texts really well because he talked to them again and again. So it requires the element not just of the Word, but the Spirit of God coming and revealing something in us. And often we say, well, I'm a word set of Christian. I'm a word set of Christian, but it, it, it can't be without the anointing of the Holy Spirit resting upon the reading, upon the life of our lives. We must learn to read the scripture, but in reading it, and I think most of us in this context have read it and know the time where the Spirit of God was the one stirring something in us. Wow, I've read this a hundred times. I've heard James a lot of times. James is doing different stuff to you, isn't he, God? Well, the Spirit's doing different stuff to you through this word. Because now is the now time for that revelation that God wants to take deeper into our spirits. We must listen, learn to listen to hear God's voice, to listen for Jesus, the good shepherd, to speak to us. And Jesus used that imagery in John 10. 
passage I'm using, again, reading from the New American Standard Bible here, truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter by the door and is told of the sheep, but finds out some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the door is the shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep, shepherd to the, the other sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep listen to his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts when he puts all his own sheep outside, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him. Why? What does it say? Because they know his voice. Church, this is what God's inviting us to at a greater level. Do we know his voice? The good shepherd, that when we're reading, empowered by the Spirit, which is the voice of the shepherd, but the Spirit that lives in us, we're like, oh my word, God help me. This is new revelation for me. This is transforming me inside out because of revelation. The older NIV translation of God updated. I like how it, it, it says in that context, just a, a recognition of knowing the voice, recognizing the voice of God in that context. And the imagery that Jesus used in, in, in chapter 10 talks about the doorkeeper, and the letter he says, I am the door. These I am is out of John, which is another whole sermon series we could do. And even later, I am the good shepherd. The imagery was to communicate that Jesus sought relationship, connection, intimacy with the sheep. He knew them. He knew them by name. He wanted them to know his voice so that they could hear and obey. Verse 27 says it very similarly. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Are we hearing his voice? Am I hearing his voice? Are you hearing his voice? Are we obeying what we're hearing? You see, God wants to take us deeper. It's this place of purpose, and the purpose is to obey, to fully obey. But to obey isn't just saying to all this stuff, all we have to follow here, and I'm going to try to hear you part, follow what we want. You know what? When I was a young person, that almost killed me. Because I tried so hard to do all the stuff that teacher went about. And whoever it was, preacher, dad, my dad was a preacher. Whoever it was, I wanted to try so hard to do it, but you know what? It wasn't until I was in YWAM with the guest program, and I encountered the person of the Holy Spirit in a very intimate way, and said that I realized this was not my work. It was the work of the powerful God, right, residing in me and the Spirit, that gave me the capacity to do the things I was supposed to do, and not to do the things that were in the It's the revelation. Because before I was trying to modify my behavior, to do the right thing, to be a good person, to look like a good little Christian. Because that's what everybody was expecting. I don't want to look like a good little Christian. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to walk with him, the good shepherd, as a sheep who knows his voice and understands what it is to be his He's invited us to that place. That's what he's invited us to at a new level in 2021, and he's speaking not because we've not done it before, but because he's saying, let's go deeper. Let's listen more attentively. Let's obey more fully. Let's be transformed by the Spirit of God in our midst. In the midst of a pandemic, why not? Come on, Lord. We need you. We're struggling. We've got a lot of emotion going on inside. We don't know. Let it boil the surface and skim off that which is in your Because we want what you want. God wants to take us deeper with him, but if we aren't hearing him speak to us, we're going to have a hard time today. It's a little bit like my, my grandson as I watch it, my parents are telling me something or whatever, and they're, I think they're usually hearing, but at least some of them are not convinced all the time to hear. Might be selective hearing, like I don't really want to hear that that mom or dad is saying, and they just go and do the exact same thing with them. But if I'm not hearing, I can't obey. Is that too complex? And then we say, well, I'm going to try harder to hear. Well, that's sort of trying harder. I think it's a greater surrender, saying, God, 
I need to grow, I want to grow in this area because I want to obey. I think about the context of my life, and I'm going to just forget the idea of, uh, you know, around that season when Jonathan was zero to six, was a formative time of my life. Not what's for you to do, it's different. <laughs> but the reality of that journey of listening and hearing and growing, I was in prevent. My dad was a chiropractor, I was going to be a doctor. Why can't? That's what I, that's what I sensed that I was supposed to do. Started college at Hillsdale University, first two years, grad school, just started dating. Two years in, we're like, we're not going to do this for four years, we're going to get married now. Because, like, the, the dating is too much money, like, you know what? We're going to get married. So that summer we got married, I transferred to EMU and finished up in EMU. Nothing changed on the radar screen at that point. I'm still thinking, I have to figure it out. I, I don't have to cheat. He's shepherd, he's telling me what to do, I'm going to get hurt. Still growing, you know, pretty young. But in that context, in that space and place, my first encounter in EMU was with my last one. Was my transfer to Roseville? And then he tells me, oh, by the way, we have your transcript, transcripts from Roseville. I went for a year at Roseville Bible Institute out of, out of high school. And all the novels had his transcripts. He said, I really encourage you to consider double degree in Bible, uh, Christian ministries, and Bible You always will have to take a couple of Bible classes that you have. I'm like, why not? Didn't think about it. Didn't think about it. In the midst of that journey, probably within a couple of months, Engaging in some Bible classes with Calvin Shank and some other things, and things that were happening in Eastern Mennonite missions around the emerging of a guest discipleship center, suddenly everything changed. I was going this direction, still had the option to go through about everything and everything started shifting over here. And my passion became how can I disciple young people, equipping and training them and sending them around the world in missions the same way that I had been to experience that. And yeah. Could have been pretty lucrative over here to be a, a chiropractor. My dad had a really good business. I could take that up. It, it would have been lucrative. I didn't even think about that. I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> What's being stirred in my heart is this. I want to do this. I want to follow what God is speaking to me in that place. And I could graduate from back in the fight and then I just for a position in the voluntary service program and somebody else. You know how it goes, like you think you gotta finally figure it out, it's like, you know what, I try to obey you and serve the Lord, and it still doesn't kind of work out the way I want it to. And so I ended up working at, for a summer at Good Books with Grow Good, and then uh, from there I was uh, at Benjamin Roberts with uh, Bob Roberts, who attended my parents' church, with a friend of mine, who was a all together. And, uh, did work very well. I was in the office as the warehouse manager there. Again, the potential for a really good, I don't say lucrative, but really a good steady job, a good, a good company. And he had a number of phone calls me one time. And he says, uh, Would you consider leading staff of Bible school students? I think I said yes on the phone at the moment. He said, Because it's such a desire of mine. But I took that, that year of good books and, and, and working with Benjamin Roberts, I looked at that and said, You know what? I was not, I didn't have a very good attitude at all. I was kind of a friend of mine, kind of wonderful. We went to a, a, a yes celebration where a bunch of guests all night were together. They were gambling and others up front. The leaders were sharing, and I kind of went out just at that. I was like, I want to do what they're doing. I'm tired of doing what I'm doing. I want to do that. And my dear wife said, uh, well, maybe when you're ready to just be at peace with what you're doing right now, Okay, I'm back. So you just stop talking right now. But the recognition of the opportunity that was wasn't quite the best. She was well, we'll, 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 we'll continue on. Um, but it requires a constant listening, constant adjustment, kind of recalibrating because God gives us some general some of the calls of it. And suddenly something happens and we respond to the nudging of that. Voice of the Good Shepherd, and we're in a different place than we thought we'd be. That's in the light of walking with Jesus. You don't have to have it all figured out, you just have to keep listening. That's what purpose is about. My purpose is to, as Jesus would have said, is to hear what the Father is doing and join with him. We're in the same place where we hear what the God is saying through the Spirit and 
going with the guy for whatever it is that's called to say. That purpose, that's the ultimate purpose for why we're here. God is asking us, inviting us to that place where we say, God, help us to hear and live. And now comes the maybe challenging part of this whole thing because the truth is, uh, this journey is not an easy one. But if we're to live with purpose and in a place of obedience, it's a journey that we must walk as disciples. Walk and grow in and learn and go deeper with God. Because this is true. My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and I follow them. Like I said, reminding me about this journey with Jesus, it's not complex. In fact, it's pretty simple. Learn to hear the voice of the shepherd. And when you hear, obey. And keep growing your ability to hear, and you surrender to that place to obey. But it isn't easy. Jesus never promised it was easy. In fact, he promised that he would go with us, he would lead us, and that invitation is to keep on listening to his voice. That brings me to my last point about purpose. And that is that at times, to purpose to obey means laying down your right to defend yourself for you to be, and for you to be okay with being misunderstood by others. If you're going to follow Jesus, there are people that can misunderstand you. In fact, even your family at times misunderstand. Most of you know that I honor and love my mom. My mom was so incredibly loyal, one of the most loyal persons I know. But when I got the call from Gail, and I went to tell my mom, she said, You can't wait to go. I'm like, I already quit. I'm like, I'm going to quit. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. My mom just backed my mouth this time. Bob gave me that job, it's a good job, and you need to keep on doing it. Not only she was happy with me for a while, because I was like, No, mom, I need to do this. I didn't have a big debate, it was one of those little discussions, and I was like, you know what? She didn't go with it, I got to go with it. But there was a place where I didn't feel like other people understood what I was pursuing, what it was that God was calling me to. This is probably one of the most difficult things about walking with Jesus, because there are times when others, in the place of obedience, including family, including others that are in the church, don't understand what it is that you've done out of a desire to obey. You gave up what? You laid down what? You, whatever it might be. Now, I am seeking to follow the Lord. This is one of the things that I want to encourage us in. I want us to extend grace to each other. To trust that the Holy Spirit that is at work in the other person is guiding them where they're supposed to be, which may not be in the same place that you are. That's hard. I think of it just this week, I was talking with, with uh, Jim Lavery. Uh, the new pastor in Mount Royal from sort of my place. And he talked about, I often heard this season in Mount Royal, for whatever reason, about 11 or 12 family units moved on from Mount Royal. How did you do that? He said, well, first of all, the reality of that context was, I don't think any one of them was leaving because they were upset with the church. And it might have been things that were, were different or had shifted or whatever, but they were trying to follow the Holy Spirit. I said, everyone, I sought to trust, to listen, and hear the Holy Spirit was doing that, to be leading them, and not to have to try to change their mind or shift things. It's just trusting the Spirit of God is in this person. How do I hear how the Spirit of God is guiding me? It's hard to be in that place where you can't defend yourself at times. Sometimes, I believe God doesn't really just allow you to. You know what? It's okay. The more you try to explain this, the more confusing it's going to be. You don't get it. So just obey. Kind of like a child. You say obey, and you're like, why? I want to know why. Because I said so. Well, that really goes over well, doesn't it? But the reality of this journey of just obeying, and sometimes not being able to defend ourselves or even be understood. Jesus models. 
we've been in the, in the, in the series uh, that we, we had over at the public meeting, we were in Philippians 2. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, he made a human life, and he found an appearance of man. He humbled himself by becoming what? Obedience to death. Now that might be death to a vision, death to a dream, death to whatever, but obedience means that I do what the shepherd is calling me to, the good shepherd, and I don't take that to the advantage of the less how helpless the act of peace to me. Because at the end of the day, that's why what the disciple does. He follows the wrath, the good shepherd, and obeys what he's calling him to. This is what I was going to refer to earlier, and I realized this is my own and I be of this. And here it says, your relationship with one another, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And the older translation of that, he says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I actually like that better. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. He had every reason to not let him come and take him to the cross. That's the last week's message of the passion. But he was willing to. We're being invited as a body of these feet to humble ourselves like Jesus, to take on the very nature of servant and to become obedient, obedient to whatever God calls us to do, even when it means that we are or might be misunderstood. And sometimes God will want us to defend ourselves or try to explain things. I think of this last uh, week, Rich TV this week. Uh, this image of the, of the bridge came up, but not that we haven't thought of it before, but just at a new level, this image of the bridge came up. And I want to talk a little bit about that. But first of all, just to say, the team that I get to work with here is an amazing team. What I love about them is they're willing to listen. And most of the time, no, I'm just going to say, as it comes clear, willing to obey, even though others might not understand what it is. I love working with a team like that. that is such an incredible place, and they need your prayers, your encouragement, your positive counsel and critique. Pray for them. But this is the image that came to mind, the image of a suspension bridge. A description of the, of the different components of the bridge were what came to mind, especially the pylons. Like, one of the pieces of this that the team as leading this, this, this season, what are we going to focus on? And that pylon thing came to mind, it's like the foundation, the footer, it goes there. You know what? I just want to say this our commitment as a bridge to all of you as a congregation is that we're committed to following the good shepherd with a purpose to obey. To completely obey what God is speaking to us. That's that definition of purpose that we talked about earlier. I'll just let you know this as a team, we are professional bridge builders. Okay. I haven't done this in real life, and I have done a lot of it in kingdom life. But that's the assignment that God has given us. We're trusting God to lead us. He will give us what we need. Will you pray for us as a rich team that God will help us to obey? Our practice in this series is to close with humanist and reflectable words. Where has the Holy Spirit been drawing our attention? And I have here three potential angles on this whole thing of purpose. Uh, choose one of the areas, put on your glasses of clarity regarding purpose, and ask God to begin to define focus in that area. Is there an area in life that God is speaking to you about? Are you willing to say, yes, God, and obey? I invite the worship team to hold it to the rest of Where is God calling you to obey? And in doing that, lay down the right to defend yourself so that he's understood. And in what way is God calling you to commit to a new level of listening and obeying today? And I'm just going to stand here for 30 seconds just to give us the time to focus on those questions and where the Holy Spirit might direct you. And then we'll move into closing with the
and he went to stand and I stayed and he sang his closing song, which is uh, Take My Life and Let It Be. And this is a song that we are singing to God. It is a confession of what we're desiring in our life. Let's sing together. Take my life Thank you so much for being here today. Blessings to each one of you. 